Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. We hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving holiday weekend. We are recording this on a Friday. And so I am full from last night still. I ate about four pounds of food and uh, collapsed in a food coma last night. So hopefully everyone had a great time. Adam, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving as well. I did. Thank you. Lots to be thankful for this year. So I know that a lot of times we talk about like this doom and gloom when we talk about the news and how many ransomware attacks there are and how it's on the rise and cyber criminals are getting more organized and motivated. Um, We've talked about how much in ransomware payments, like they've gone up over the years. And so it just seems like more and more bad news on top of another. And we seem to be playing catch up as defenders. But what I wanted to centralize this episode around is a lot of the news that I've been reading and how I kind of see the cybersecurity industry actually going on the offense and maybe a little bit more good news and hope going into the next year as we try to close out this year. So in the news, if you remember back in May, there was an organization called Revil that was behind the Colonial Pipeline attack and colonial pipeline ended up having to pay about 4.4 million dollars in ransom in bitcoin and that kind of started the ball rolling of doj and the u.s government getting behind trying to apprehend or put a stop to this because colonial pipeline was critical infrastructure it was an oil pipeline and We also had a new administration that I think takes cybersecurity a little bit more seriously than the previous administration. So you started to see things happen after this. So in June, shortly after the attack, the Department of Justice announced that it actually had recovered 2.3 million in Bitcoin back. So it confiscated and tracked the payments that went to Revil and confiscated it back. And then in July, Revil struck again. So put them on the radar again. They were behind another ransomware attack that hit an IT software vendor called Kaseya, and it affected more than 1,000 companies because this was another one of those supply chain attacks. And what we didn't know at the time was that the FBI actually had obtained the decryption key. They had compromised Revil's servers, and they had obtained the key. Now, they sat on the key for a few weeks because they wanted to use that to counterattack them. But then uh, Revil actually went offline unexpectedly. No one knows why, but they just kind of closed up shop. They they closed down their servers. Everything went dark. And so the FBI didn't have a chance to use the key to attack them. We had talked about this previously, but Revol uses affiliates. And so there's an organization and then there's affiliate organizations that use the ransomware and have to like pay back the mother company, the mother group. And when the whole thing shut down, another member basically spun the servers back up. So, I mean, it's very independent, loosely, you know, run criminal organization, but they spun the servers back up. And what happened was the FBI had compromised its backups. And so one of the tricks that a lot of cyber criminals use against us as defenders is they compromise our backups. And then when we restore from backups, it's still compromised. And that's what happened. And so when Revil spun up their servers back from backups they were compromised by the fbi the fbi then went ahead and used their backdoor and 
completely dismantled and took down their servers permanently. This was something that wasn't, wouldn't have happened previously. Like if you follow news, like the DOJ, the FBI, we don't go on offensive campaigns like this. And this newfound success was really in part of the new freedoms that the U S deputy attorney recently determined that ransomware attacks on critical infrastructure are a national security on par with terrorism. So that allows the justice department to bring in assistance from the Pentagon and U S intelligence agencies before none of these agencies wanted to even have anything to do with hacking into forums or attacking other cyber criminal groups and the military didn't want to have to do anything with it either. And so when this was determined as a national security threat, additional resources were able to be brought on and now we're going on the offensive. And finally, a couple weeks ago, DOJ announced that it had worked with other international law enforcement to arrest a member of Revol linked with the attacks to Kaseya. So Ukrainian national Yaroslav Velasinski is facing extradition to the U.S. after Polish authorities detained him in October and after the U.S. indicted him for cybercrimes in August. DOJ also seized $6.1 million in assets linked to Revol. The money belonged to a Russian national who was also indicted, working for Revol with corporate and government targets. So that was kind of the whole chain of just Revol in, you know, timeline from when they attacked to when DOJ and U.S. government officials have their eye on counterattacking and finally bringing a couple people to justice. And I think you're going to start seeing this more and more often. I'll take a breath there and let you respond, but Adam, but uh, I just wanted to say, you know, this is not something that we have seen in the past years where the U.S. government has been this involved in bringing ransomware criminals to justice. You know, it's it's almost a loaded term at this point, but to talk about the war on terrorism, which was a you know, kind of 20-year effort that continues, but um, we, we most closely associate with the last 20 years or so um, with the winding down of operations in Afghanistan. And, and that's to say the United States certainly has experience with thinking in those terms, right? Our, our different agencies, whether that's Homeland Security or the Pentagon from a both offensive as well as defensive perspective, have familiarity with that. So when you begin to start to consider these attacks as a form of terrorism, then we have kind of a, a counterterrorism playbook as far as disrupting those threats to the United States. And I think that's kind of what you're seeing here is – adapting that playbook and some of those ideas that have already been put into place as far as how do we disrupt these bad actors and prevent them from carrying out essentially terrorism against the United States. And um, that might be, and probably is a gross oversimplification of what's actually happening here. But that's how I kind of mentally think about it when you talk about classifying it in that way and, and how we've been able to make some counterattacks that's obviously counterterrorism, which again, I think the United States certainly has spent a lot of time thinking about and has had, you know, varying degrees of success, uh, um, to be sure. So that's, that's really interesting. And I like kind of you, you walking through some of those successes because I think we've heard some of them in passing as we follow the news, but to hear them kind of all pulled together really builds this thread that positive things are happening and things are happening in a different way than before because we've talked about on this show and, and any other security focused forum that ultimately to disrupt the volume of ransomware, it has to become unattractive. Either there isn't a lucrative financial side to it or there is the very real threat of being held accountable um, from a, a international law perspective. And it sounds like we are doing this on multiple fronts. We are eliminating or at least reducing the, the lucrative financial side of it. And then there becomes the very real threat that you could be held accountable 
under international law. And there are countries that are friendly to the West that will participate in extradition to the United States or other countries, Western countries, where you could be held accountable to your actions. So lots of good, positive things here. And maybe a little bit of an uncomfortable space to talk about because we're really well beyond technology at this point and we're to international law mechanisms and, and actual military engagement and legal engagement and justice engagement. But that is the level of engagement I think it's going to take to make a tangible disruption and reduction in these activities. Yeah, and I mentioned that this administration is kind of taking cybersecurity more serious. In May, President Biden signed an executive order to improve the nation's cybersecurity and protect federal government networks. In June, President Biden met with President Putin in Geneva for a Russia-U.S. summit where they discussed a lot of things. But what was interesting, if you read some of the news, was it was talked about almost in a Cold War sense how cybersecurity should be handled like a nuclear deterrence policy like you know we have our things and you have your things and if you attack us we're going to attack you and it's not going to be it's going to be mutual destruction Mutually right essentially sure destruction yeah correct and so it was almost like you know there are some things that you should not be you know attacking as a cybersecurity offense so like critical infrastructure biden specifically told putin like some of this stuff is off limits and to be fair i don't think biden was accusing putin of sponsoring this activity putin certainly didn't take responsibility for any of the cyber attacks but we all know i think that anything that happens in russia Putin knows about. So what Biden was basically saying is clean up your own house, mm -hmm. right? And I think we've seen some of that in the news where some of these groups are facing actual pressure. I think the initial time when Revo went offline, that was because of internal Russian authorities kind of pressuring that, right? And so there have been some step ups on the Russian side to police their own house, so to speak. And so you can tell that government agencies are working together. And then in July, he issued a, a national security memorandum outlining the best cybersecurity practices that responsible owners and operators of critical infrastructure should be doing. And overall, you know, he even recognized cybersecurity month, put out another statement in, in October. And so, Again, this administration, I think it's going to take that level of engagement, like you said, on a national government, international, you know, cooperation in order to put a dent into the unchecked cyber criminals that have been, you know, operating without any scrutiny for years. You know, and obviously we, we want to stay very far away from any political discussion on this show because it's just not our jam. However, I, I think it's fair to say that it had reached a almost tipping point where regardless of administration, maybe let me preface that with a competent administration, was going to recognize that there needed to be some engagement here. And, and so certainly I think the, the Biden administration has done a good job of becoming more prescriptive with their guidance and becoming more actively engaged in the process. But I think it had become regardless of administration that was in power at the time, it had just reached that tipping point where it's like, guys, you, you have to engage here. You can't farm this out and say that's, you know, the responsibility of corporate America where they're dealing with budgets and uh, leadership and um, sorry, like leadership transitions and political power plays and all the reasons corporate America sometimes is terrible at cybersecurity it just needed leadership from the government on this. And you talked about the executive order in May was really prescriptive. And it talked about things like zero trust network architecture as an example. And, and all of these things have just gotten much more detailed on a, the government kind of 
cleaning up their own house and making sure that government agencies met a certain level of cybersecurity sophistication, but also providing that guidance to corporate America that if you are part of the nation's infrastructure and you know, you're say an electric company or you're an oil pipeline or whatever, here are some things you need to do to make sure that your house is in order as well. So, you know, I'm not trying to like not give credit where credit is due, but I'm also just trying to recognize that I think again, any competent administration was going to reach the point where something had to be done because the status quo was unsustainable. And other things are happening too. So we've talked about the Pegasus malware on this show before, which is a no click zero day malware that infects iPhones and Android phones, but famously it infects iPhones because Apple has very, very good security. We assume that most things can't be compromised in this way, but this was like a zero click message that can be sent to you. It turns your phone into basically a 24 seven surveillance device and copy messages that you send, receive harvest photos, record your phone calls. I mean, it's really, really bad. And it was sold to governments and other agencies to spy on human rights folks and celebrities and other things that, um, we, you know, as normal citizens, we don't really have to worry about getting targeted like this. But if you were in the, you know, scope of a government who you may have pissed off, then they may be surveilling your phone using this. It was developed and marketed and licensed by an Israeli company called the NSO Group. And while it doesn't directly say that they are tied to the Israeli government. Many people think they are in the fact that, again, most of these groups can't operate without complete scrutiny, well, no scrutiny from the government of which the country that they reside in. Just like how Russian cyber criminals can't get away with Putin not knowing something, there's probably no way that this group is able to operate in Israel without the Israeli government having some sort of say in what they're doing. And so backhandedly, it was like the Israeli government was sponsoring this in, in some way, not directly saying that, but it was assumed implicitly. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, this was very bad. Uh, this group was selling exploits and um, doing it on a government international level earlier this month the Department of Commerce announced that it was sanctioning four groups for their roles in spying and other malicious targeting of journalists and academics. One of those groups is the NSO group, and three other entities are from Israel, Russia, and Singapore. But this means that they cannot do anything that imports or exports things that are related to U S technology and they can't use this stuff to develop their products. So in order to use any type of U S products and import it like an iPhone, like they need to have an iPhone in order to further their technology and their malware. They can't do that anymore unless they receive some special end user review committee that says they can do that with an exception, it would actually fall normally under the presumption of denial, which means that they're just automatically denied any type of import request. And so that really puts a damper on their ability to do business. It was reported that the company was basically on the ropes due to these sanctions and then on top of that, it was just announced that Apple is suing the NSO group to try to hold it accountable for surveillance and targeting of Apple users and seeking a permanent injunction to ban them from using Apple devices, software, and services. So that further kind of is the nail in the coffin, I think. But again, you can see that these groups who are actively trying to be the bad guys, I would say, in the cybersecurity world are slowly being pursued and it's becoming hopefully untenable or at least putting pressure 
and causing some doubt that this can be their way of business going forward. So I think, again, you see more and more positive improvement, not just in the defenses itself, but from companies and governments putting pressure on these groups. The NSO group is particularly interesting and, and, Certainly, I I darn near lump them in with companies like Celebrite, although Celebrite tends to be seen as a little more legitimate, but still the same thing where they're, they're essentially in the business of hoarding exploits, not responsibly disclosing them to companies and maintaining those exploits for you know, semi-legit slash nefarious purposes. And and a cell group in particular has been tied to authoritarian regimes using that technology to spy on activists and journalists and uh, political enemies and and just using it for all sorts of awful things. Like this is, this is bad hacking. This is not ethical hacking um, with how these tools are being used in the wrong way. And so it's really interesting here, two things. Number one, talking about like import export controls. That is the mechanism through which the United States essentially uh, destroyed Huawei's business. It, it, to use a, an example people might be familiar with, um, Huawei was you know a, a Chinese manufacturer of smartphones and handsets and also a lot of 4G and 5G like network technology that goes into towers and base stations and, and builds the network behind the scenes. And essentially, they were banned from using and importing technology like Google uh, Android and the Google Play Store and Google Play services and all that, which essentially made them a non-player in the smartphone space. And at the same time, United States companies like Sprint and T-Mobile and AT&T and Verizon were banned from using Huawei technology to build out their networks. So this is that same kind of mechanism here again enforcement mechanism that can be very devastating to a company um, and is very, very serious business. So I actually didn't know about that until I just heard it on the podcast just now, but that's really, really fascinating. Now the Apple lawsuit is particularly interesting. Now, first off Apple, uh, the issued a press release on this. And then of course, because their filings are, are in the court system here in the United States, those filings are public and you can read the accusations for yourselves. And they are fascinating to say the least. This is not written in like super legalese. It's, it's easily understood, especially like the, the first part of the complaint. So it's something you can go read for yourself and, and it is scintillating. So I won't kind of spoil that, but I will say it's worth a read. But what's interesting here is this is shades of how the FBI took down Al Capone in the sense that they never got him on some of the major like criminal activities that he had participated in. They ultimately got him on things like tax evasion. So what they're getting the NSO group on here is that for the NSO group to do a lot of their exploration to develop these hacks, they created a whole bunch of Apple IDs. Well, as part of creating an Apple ID, you agree to an end user license agreement from Apple. And one of the things that is stated in there is that all litigation shall happen in, you know, the Northern California district court, blah, blah, blah. So that gave Apple the jurisdiction to sue this Israeli company in the United States in their backyard in the California court system. That's interesting. And it also is NSO's abuse of Apple IDs to create these hacks that open the door for them to be sued in the first place. So there's some interesting legal machinations there as far as how Apple started this whole process and got the ball rolling. That is also really fascinating. If this goes to trial, there are going to be some really interesting and I think blockbuster testimony to come out of it. So stay tuned to that, but I was really honestly excited about it because I have a very low opinion of groups like the NSO group. And again, I lump Celebrite in there as well. And I think it's really fascinating um, if this goes to trial to see some of the things that become publicly disclosed. Whenever you have discovery of these big tech companies and all these private internal emails become public record, it's always delicious. So stay tuned there. But this was um, something I'm really enthusiastic about. And as far as like things getting better, exciting to see uh, somebody striking back against 
these platforms that we trust with every aspect of our life being used for malicious purposes. And what's also one last interesting thing before we move on from this subject is that as opposed to Apple kind of using this as an opportunity to take pot shots at Android for their security posture, they instead treat Android as a compatriot in these efforts that this is not just a risk to iOS, but this is a potential risk for Android users as well. Um, maybe not with specifically NSO group Pegasus malware, but other malware as well. And these kind of activities just, we need to try to put the damper on them in any way we can. Other positive things that I see in the industry, bug bounties are increasing. GitLab recently increased its payouts for critical vulnerabilities by 75% with a new commitment to pay between $20,000 and $30,000, $35,000 for critical issues. And then they raised the top payout for other severities by 50%. In the last two years, Microsoft, Google, and Atlassian had also raised their awards for researchers who reported bugs. A year ago, Microsoft boosted its top Windows bounty to $100,000, and then they added high impact bonuses over the past year for a variety of the applications and cloud services. Microsoft runs 17 different bug bounty programs across where 341 researchers submitted a total of 1200 plus qualifying reports for a combined $13.6 million in payout in the year ending June, 2021. Google almost doubled their payout as well. It paid out, um, about 6.7 million to 662 researchers with the top award of $132,000, 500 for a single vulnerability. Atlassian doubled its top reward to $10,000 in May and GitHub paid out more than $524,000 to its researchers in 203 reported vulnerabilities. So again, positive movement because bug bounties are one of the best ways that you can extend your in-security in-house security programs and you reduce um, the you know the cost of identifying vulnerabilities so if you can pay someone out to look over your software instead of suffering some sort of breach it's overall going to be better now there's some double-edged sword stuff that goes on too what they found out is if you have a really good bug brownie program it actually incentivizes your in-house developers to be a little bit lazier because they're like, Oh, I can just put out bad code and they're going to catch it in the bug bounty, hopefully. So, you know, you want to stay on top of your application security. It's very, very important. We have that shift left mentality where you want to build security in rather than, you know, have it discovered when it goes prod at my previous company, we used a, program called bug crowd which is also very very good it actually you can put your external facing applications out there or even dev applications provide you know urls ip addresses whatever and allow bug crowd researchers which are just bug bounty hunters to test your code pen test your code and see what kind of bugs they can come up with and then you can pay them and some of them are small. You can limit it to, you know, a $150, $200 payout to up to like $1,500 payout. And it's a very easy way for companies to get a little bit of, of a bug bounty program themselves without having to run it themselves. You're sourcing it out to bug crowd to do it. And they act as a middleman and they even have researchers there who will vet the code that uh, the bug that is being submitted. So very good movement in the bug bounty industry. I think I th we've talked about that as a career, even for some people who are very good at it. And so again, more positive movement that I'm seeing in the industry in general, where we're taking security seriously, not just in our own defenses, but also as an industry whole. Love bug bounty programs and that, statement you made around bug bounty programs might disincentivize developers into writing secure code up front. You know, there's research in different areas. So for example, with bicycles and helmet laws, there tends to be 
that if you don't require helmets, you have fewer bicycle accidents than if you do. I believe that's been studied and compared to like the Netherlands, which has a, you know, huge bicycle culture and people don't wear helmets in the Netherlands, I believe. And they have very, very low incidence of bicycle accidents compared to countries that do have helmet laws. They actually tend to have more bike accidents. So I don't know if it's a false sense of security, but that's been studied in other areas. Now, no guarantee that translates over, but that's an interesting observation as, as a potential thing. You know, one thing I like to encourage people to do is to judge organizations, maybe not based on like how bug free or secure their code is up front. Obviously, those are good goals, but bug free code or perfectly secure code does not exist. And so ultimately, it comes down to how do they treat security researchers? How quickly are responsibly disclosed bugs patched and fixed? And are they doing right by the security community as well as their end users, you know, as far as shipping those patches in a timely fashion in a, um, in a really good way. And so to me, obviously the North star is bug free, perfectly secure code, but since that's not going to happen, really how you should judge major software developers is on how they implement these programs. And so I love to hear it. And I think it's a really, um, just a really good way to uh, have sets of different thought processes and eyes and ears on software and, and making sure it's secure as it can all be. So as compared to the previous topic of discussion, which are uh, organizations who hoard vulnerabilities and do not responsibly disclose them and do not take advantage of those bug bounty programs, I think that's you know unethical ultimately. I think there is nothing more um, honorable and ethical than being a uh, security researcher and responsibly disclosing your findings. I, I love you guys and gals out there uh, who do that and, and keep up the great work. Yeah, ultimately, it's trying to incentivize folks to responsibly disclose the bugs rather than hoard them and, and sell them otherwise, right? So right. And, and all, the, all the things are, are moving in the right direction. And finally, another key component I see a lot of change that gives me hope for the industry is that there are a lot of new regulations and certifications that are out there. I know when I say certifications, all of the cybersecurity folks who listen to this are going to roll their eyes and say yet another audit, but I think it is important in some sense. It's it's a double-edged sword. I know because it's similar to like a standardized test that kids have to be given to pass a certain grade or something like that. Right. That you start teaching to the test, just like you start doing your cybersecurity to pass the audit. Um, so I, I do think that there is some sense of that, but it still is important. Uh, some new regulations are out as well. One of the things that piqued my interest was the FDIC, the federal deposit insurance corporation and the board of, governors of the Federal Reserve System and the Office of the Comptroller of Currency announced its final version of the Computer Security Incident Notification Requirements. That is a mouthful. For banking organizations and the bank services. Under the new Cybersecurity Incident Notification Rule, banks in the United States are required to notify federal regulators of any cybersecurity in incidents within 36 hours of discovering it. Now, the rule is going to take place on April 1st in 20. 22, although enforcement will not begin until May 1st. So I think this is a positive thing. You hear a lot of times where a breach gets reported or some incident gets reported and, you know, the company knew about it like six months ago or a year ago and they found some stuff and they didn't really like disclose it. And I think that is not good for consumers. It's not good for the shareholders. It's not good for the industry in general. If there, if there is an incident, one of the things that we talk about is cybersecurity is a team sport, right? If there's an incident, I hope that they reach out and get the right resources to make sure that everything is good to go. Maybe those companies are doing that. Maybe they're hiring someone to do it. But as we are discussing here, the federal government is starting to get involved. I'm hoping that compromised companies can request federal resources as well to try to, you know, 
help them if there is an incident that happens. But these new reporting requirements, at least in the banking industry, I think are a good thing. I'm hoping that these type of regulations roll over to other industries as well. In manufacturing, I know that a lot of my customers that I talk to are in manufacturing and there is a new certification that came out. Oh, I think about a year ago, maybe um, called the cybersecurity maturity model certification, the CMMC, which was required for DOD contractors on certain contracts, but now it may start to begin to apply to non DOD contractors. Again, there was no way for the federal government to prove that a contractor was actually doing the things that needed to be done. The federal government provided guidance on how you should secure your company, but they never had a way to say, yes, this is, you know, blessed. And so this new certification that anyone who does business with a DOD has to go through in order to get certain contracts is going to put everyone on the same level. It's going to say, at least we know that if you pass this certification, you have this type of defense in place and you can prove it. So again, I think those are positive things for the industry yet. It is another certification, but at least it's a baseline that everyone can say, we know that you're doing certain things. If you pass this. Love hearing about a required disclosure from an incident, uh, starting in the financial services sector or the banking sector, I guess, ultimately. But that's something that we can follow as folks who might work in different industries and see how that plays out. Because I think that's potentially another path that needs to be explored is some sort of required disclosure for if you suffer an incident. Because publicly traded companies, they're required to submit financial documents to the Securities and Exchange Commission if there are substantial changes to their business outlook. If something happens that changes the nature or the course of their business, they're required to disclose that. And this is something that I think companies have borderline skirted Securities and Exchange Commission requirements for disclosure on already. Um, by not disclosing their breaches in a timely fashion for their their investors who invest in their company. And I'm actually surprised we've gotten this far down the road where that's not been a bigger deal because lots of publicly traded companies have suffered very large cybersecurity incidents and have honestly not notified their investors who deserve to know in a timely fashion. And so this is an interesting um kind of first step, I think, towards requiring better and more timely notification. So I'm curious to see how this plays out. Again, uh, just to reiterate what Andy said, this is going to take effect April 1. So coming up here in about five months and enforcement will begin 30 days later on May 1, 2022. So stay tuned to that and let's keep an eye on the banking industry and see how that plays out for them. Because ultimately, and, and I'd be curious to dig into this and understand like what the thresholds are for disclosure. If they have to disclose every little thing, it might become too noisy and not relevant. Uh, on the converse side, if the bar to disclosure is too high and they never have to disclose and we don't hear anything, well, that might not be terribly interesting either. So we'll see how this plays out. As far as CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification that you mentioned, Andy, I too am very, very bullish on that certification. So I've worked with manufacturing customers that have government or DOD contracts for quite some time. And it wasn't that long ago that I had a customer who said, well, we can't move our email to the cloud because we're a government contractor. Like they were totally on premises, everything old school as the day was long because they said their federal requirements and, and, um, contracts required them to stay on premises. They couldn't meet those requirements in the cloud, which was kind of bonkers to me because I felt like that wasn't the way to go. And one of the things I really like about CMMC is that it's actually very modern. A lot of it is really, you know, you almost, like you said, roll your eyes when you hear about another audit or another um, requirement to meet. And especially whenever you get 
government involved, it tends to be very old school, uh, you know, skating to where the puck has already been to, you know, borrow that Wayne Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky quote. But CMMC is actually pretty good and pretty modern. And if you adopt a lot of those practices, you're in a pretty healthy, modern state for your cybersecurity posture. So I really, really like CMMC, and I'm excited to see where that goes as well, because yes, there are companies that are required to meet a certain level of CMMC certification, but a lot of companies are adopting it voluntarily because they like it and because it prepares them to win government business potentially in the future. So that is also something to keep an eye on where it really turns the whole conversation on its ear from in the old days, government kind of held back companies from being modern and secure and now really helps them look more forward. Yeah. I mean, great conversation again. I hope that the way that I looked at the news and, and saw some of the signs uh, of where the industry is moving can give everyone else who's listening to the show some hope because I think a lot of times we think it's hopeless and we're just fighting an uphill battle and uh, you know, we're, we're playing from behind. Right. And so I think I do see a positive trend. I do see things improving while it is slow. It's like trying to steer the Titanic in some ways. And and we all want things to happen now, right now these days, but uh, I do see the winds changing. So, um, I wanted to have this conversation to, you know, kind of talk about my thoughts and how I, I think the, the industry is, is moving in a positive direction. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions about the show or other topics you want us to talk about, our contact information will be in the show notes and you can reach out to us. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.